today I'm going to talk to you about the paradox of greatness. And maybe I thought about renaming the sermon the paradox of shortness. I've got a short amount of time to tell you about the paradox of greatness, you know. Uh, and uh, and um, I have a way of taking small things and turning them into big things, okay? So it's really hard for me to think otherwise of taking something big and turning it into small. That I have a real hard time in that reverse order. But, uh, but, I, but I will tell you this, that I do believe the, the place that I'm going to share with you, if you grab your outline uh, beside you there, the place that I'm going to share with you is uh, just a couple of verses of Scripture. And uh, it also is a, it's possible that you've even read a book about, uh, about this guy named Jabez. And, um, and, and you may agree or disagree with some of the things that have been said or written about him. But what we're going to actually do is let the text speak for itself here this morning. And uh, we're not focusing on what others have or haven't said about, uh, about him. Um, we're going to focus on, on, on this, uh, this setting. So I want you to look with me at the scripture found in First, First Chronicles chapter 4, uh, verses 9 and 10. It's pretty certain that Ezra is probably the person who penned this. And, uh, and so we'll, uh, let's, let's, here he is, a, a scribe that has written down a number of things that God wanted shared with us uh, at, a, at, at this time in our lives and for people throughout history, this information to be shared. It says, there was a man named Jabez who is more distinguished, understand it said more distinguished than any of his brothers. His mother named him, that's a typo there, um, it says his, but it should be say him. Uh, his mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel. Now, let me just stop here a minute. I'm going to talk about the name thing here in a minute. But aren't you glad that, um, that uh, we don't seem to name people today by the worst memory we have of them? <laughs> like, uh, you know, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't go around calling people pain in the neck, even though they might be one. It's like, you know, we, we so, but in that time period, oftentimes they named people kind of something that reflected uh, um, uh, some character trait that they saw early on or something about them uh, that happened. You know, uh, Jacob was called Hill, Hill Grasper uh, because he was, uh, he, was, he was a second born twin, a very unhappy second born twin. Um, I have, uh, uh, Hunter is, is 18 months younger than Skylar, and I'm going to tell you, in his mind, it makes absolutely no sense why he's younger. He is convinced he should be the older and he should be in charge. And, uh, and, and in fact, I'm pretty sure he thinks he probably ought to be in charge of me and Angie too. So um, not just not just of Skylar. But, so there, but, but, you know, but we did not name him Hill Grasper. I just tell stories about him on Sunday morning. Um, but uh, hopefully when he's not around, every once in a while I'll say, you're not going to tell a story about me. Because every once in a while I'll tell him, hey, I told this story about you. And he goes, so every once in a while on the way to church, he goes, you're not telling a story about me today, are you? And so, you know, but... Um, but anyway, I don't think he minds too bad. And uh, he made if you heard him. Um, he was the one, now listen, we're still talking about Jabez here. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel. Interesting statement. Oh, that you would bless me and extend my lands. Please keep me in all that I do and, and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted his request. Now, I want to share five noteworthy characteristics of the paradox of greatness from his life. Now, I think in the New Testament, it's pretty clear Jesus demonstrated this paradox of greatness by leaving heaven, coming to earth, and being, and, and kind of hanging his God hat, so to speak, even though he still was God, hanging his God hat on the rack for a little while for 30 some years while in the sense of, of, of being in all places at all times, that kind of thing, and limited himself to human form, to being a man. So he was God and he was man. But as a man, he, uh, he, he experienced the things that we experienced. So he submitted himself to that process to become a man. And, and so we, then as God man, as he had his disciples gathered around him, he demonstrated to them what he considered to be greatness by washing their feet. 
and that was something that someone, a servant, would often do. And certainly not the master, not the teacher was the one, but he taught them a lesson of what true greatness looked like, and it looked like that basin and that towel and uh, serving of other people, being willing to do the humble task and do what, uh, do, do what others did not really want to do. Sometimes we're just kind of forced to do uh, in order to serve, serve other people. So here in the Old Testament, we see this example of somebody who really represents to us um, a paradox of greatness, in, in, in my opinion. And so the first one is people of greatness choose to see themselves the way God sees them. Now, you understand in this context, first of all, let's look at the biblical context. Ezra's writing, the scribe is writing down, and if you were to go back into this passage, what you'll see is, you'll see he's writing, this is one of those passages where probably for your devotions, you just kind of go, now how quick can I read through this? Because it's all these, unless you're just doing a really a big study of, uh, of, of genealogies in the Bible, you're looking at this and going, wow, this is so-and-so, you know, begot so-and-so, and so-and-so's dad is this, and so-and-so's this and that, and the other brother, and all this stuff, with all these descendants and who's related to who and these uh, gene genealogical records. And so he's writing down this stuff. He's talking about who's who and who's what and this and this, the descendants of Joel, blah, 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 and going down through here. And then, and, and uh, not Joel, but of others, Joel's in chapter 5, but these, these people. And then he comes to this point, and it's like God rests his hand on him and 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 whispers sort of so as to speak in his ear if you remember those who wrote were being inspired by god to write the things that he wrote that, that they wrote so that we'd have and all of a sudden it seems to just kind of take a detour and he's like um ezra i want you to insert here something about jabez and so probably ezra's thinking well let's see i'm trying to, who was his father because see that's what made you a person of significance was knowing where you came from you couldn't just drop in here into this genealogy stuff out of nowhere. Where's your, where do you come from? Who, what's your pedigree? Where do you, who's your father? Who's your grandfather? Who's, and so here's how it goes. There was a man. We don't know who his father was. There's some speculation that actually uh, Jabez's father deserted him at a young age or that maybe he was an illegitimate child in that sense of how that term is used. Not that any child is illegitimate, but I'm saying in that sense of that, uh, he was, a, he was a child born out of wedlock. And so we don't know. There's not any verification of any of that. We do know that he caused a lot of pain in his birth. And we, it, you know, it could seem as though it was in the giving of birth that that was the case. But we don't know. Who, here's this man named Jabez. And, and, I, and I'm thinking, that, you know, this, this scribe uh, is thinking, well, but okay, so Jabez, you know. We can't even come up with his dad here. We can't come up with his so what, why would we be writing about him? And you could almost sense maybe God nudging him to say, well, here, I want you to write this down about him. He was more distinguished than any of his brothers. He was more distinguished. He, was, he stood out. He was more honorable, some translations say, more honorable than his brothers. And uh, in, 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 this, in this setting, I can almost imagine the scribe as we're wanting to argue a little bit with God and say, well, actually, it's kind of a blight on him that we can't even identify who his father is. I mean, that, that, that's seen as, uh, uh, it, this, this man cannot be someone of greatness or someone who is, who is uh, who, who's a distinguished person or an honorable person. And, uh, and, so, and so there's that context of that going on here. But here's what I want to tell you, and that is, People of greatness choose to see themselves the way God sees them. See, people look at people from a variety of lens. And we have a tendency to see people the way we either think they should be or, 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 or maybe where they come from. And we limit them initially. We just go ahead and limit them because of their circumstances. Now, most of us know enough about history and enough about people to know there have been many people over the years that have risen above their circumstances. Jabez is one of those individuals who appears to have done that. Now, in this situation, obviously his mother had named him Jabez as a reflection of the painful 
of the pain that she experienced around his birth. And again, most people consider that to be childbirth. Uh, there are some people who would say, well, it could even be that uh, because of not knowing who his father is, there was a story there, and there was pain associated with that. We don't know, but we know that his, his name meant pain or one who causes pain. And so you can just imagine growing up with a label like that. You know, you think your name was bad. Um, my, my middle name is Greer, Rodney Greer Addison. And, uh, you know, I used to think, I mean, my, my, my brother, just older than I am, his name is Stephen Donald Addison. Now, you know where he got the name Donald from? An uncle of ours that we all love. I mean, I, my, my uncle Donald was like awesome. You know, he used to, he was uh, HVAC, he was my dad's brother, younger brother. And when I, we would go visit my granny in Durham, North Carolina, he ran. He, he would take me with him for the day, and we'd crawl under houses, and I'd watch him do what he did, and all. He just and always treat me to stuff, and all. He was just an awesome guy. So I like Donald. I like my uncle Donald. My brother Steve is named after him. So at some point, it's gone on me like Greer. I know nobody in the whole family named Greer. What, 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 and I, I finally found out there was a Greer, South Carolina, or something. I was born in South Carolina, so I'm thinking, huh? I guess I'm named after a town. I don't know. So finally, one day, I asked my mom. I said. Uh, Mom, why, why do I have the name Greer? Oh, she said, uh, we had a doctor friend that we really liked a lot, and his, his last name was Greer. Like, well, who is this guy? You know, doesn't matter. You know, I mean, I, have no, I, I still have no idea who he, who he was or what. He, he's a doctor. That's great. You know, you could, I, there's other doctors, with my opinion, better names, you know, than Greer. But anyway, but you can imagine on the playground, Greer rhymes with some words. You don't have to have a lot of imagination to think about one of them in particular that kind of stuck, you know? And so um, now because of I never ever viewed myself in that kind of way or whatever, it never really seemed to have much impact on me. But I can remember my, that name getting some usage, you know, out there. So I can just imagine, you know, if your middle name is one who causes pain, you know, can you just imagine what that might, I mean, you go to Starbucks. I don't know if they had Starbucks back, no, anyway, obviously. But anyway, he goes to Starbucks, what's the first thing they do? Ask for your name. Hey, could the pain come up and get your, you know, I mean, they holler out, you know, uh, uh, you know, we got a moco for pain. You know, everybody's going, oh, can I get one of those? No, he's the pain, you know, it's it, that kind of thing. Or you go to the door and knock on the door and say, uh, hey, I'm here to pick up, you know, Susie Q for a date, uh, Mr. Johnson. And your daughter, you know, and Mr. Johnson says, and who are you? Oh, uh, um, my name is Jabez. And, and, and what you're saying is, I'm one who causes pain. I say, oh, no, thank you. You know, we don't need that in our lives. You know, it's just, so I don't know what all he grew up with. But the, the, the fact is, his, that label he carried did not help him very much. So here's what happens sometimes with the label. We begin to believe them. It appears as though Jabez actually believed something different than that. He believed that God loved him and cared about him. We've been talking about that today. Been talking about it in the kids' stuff. Been talking about it in this song. You know, God loves you. God, do you believe it? See, I believe Jabez believed that. This, it, this is a person who could have easily been put down because of the circumstances of his life, because of the name he carried. But he, he actually, God said through the scribe, Ezra, this is a person who is more distinguished more honorable than any of his brothers now, he didn't become honorable because of his name because of his circumstances he became honorable because of the god that he served and because he believed that god loved him no matter what other people thought about him or called him he rose above because he believed the truth of god rather than the words of man number two people of greatness believe god can still answer their greatest prayers in the midst of their greatest pain. Quite certain that he experienced some pain from some of these things, but right even in the midst of that, here he is, somebody who says, I believe God can help me rise above this pain and this painful situation. If you think about the fact that he prayed the kind of prayer that he prayed, 
he believed some things about God that other people did not. And so here, God's writing this testimonial of his life. And God says to the guy that's writing this book, I want you to write this. He was the one that prayed. He's the one that prayed. I want you to write that in there. He's the one that prayed. Think about this. There were a lot of people. He had, it says he had brothers. He had his, you know, other people. It seems as though they may not have been praying. They may not have been talking to God. It might even have been that as God was looking at him, he would have thought, well, I'm, I'm sure that individual, I mean, he's got a lot going on for him, really, would be talking to me. Already have a lot of things in place. But what distinguished, one of the things that distinguished him was the fact that he's the one that prayed. He's the one that, he's the one that prayed. And, you know, um, I'm thinking here whenever we go through difficulties, we kind of have two choices. One is, can I turn our back toward God and shut him down or to embrace him, to turn toward him? And it appears as though Jabez made the choice to talk to God. He's the one who prayed. You know, prayer, if you believe the Bible, moves the heart of God. We don't understand that completely because it's almost as though we're God's God. What does my talking to him have to do? Well, read the stories of the Bible. Read what the Bible says about prayer, and it seems pretty obvious that prayer moves the heart of God. And Jabez is a classic example of a guy that started from the bottom. And, uh, and, and now he's here because he prayed. He's being written about in the Word of God, not because he was born into some fluffy, cool situation, but because he prayed. He went old school. He actually prayed. He, he, he was, you know, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to pray about this stuff I'm dealing with, about this stuff that I care about, this stuff that I'm concerned about. I have nothing else to lean on. I have nothing else to be able to absorb this pain, to be able to handle and know what to do. I can't medicate with money. Um, I, I, I can't medicate with friends. Um, it seems like that maybe he wasn't in a high ranking in that regard uh, i can't medicate on my next big thing because there is no next big thing um, i'm gonna pray he still asked god for great things and god indicated he answered those prayers now i, I just want to ask you this because it seems so simple what does it take for you to pray does it does it does it require that you come kind of like run out of all other options or is it a first option now i don't care when you pray in one sense how whatever got you there it's a good thing but the truth of the matter is it's a better thing if it is our natural default you're facing a situation you're facing a decision you're facing a scenario and if your default is pray and you say, well, I, you know, I've prayed about a lot of things, and I've never had God write anything in the sky. You know, I've never had God, God write anything in the sky either. But I can promise you this, that I've almost always felt better about the things that I have dealt with in life if I prayed about them. If I didn't pray about them, then I was always left wondering a little bit, since I didn't even invite God into this. I mean, maybe, may, I, I know he cares, and maybe he still, I'm sure he was still working but I didn't invite him into it. Is God like the first thing that we go to or the very last resort? It seems like that God looked at this guy and going, hey, he, he, he called out to me. He reached out to me. Um, and, uh, and, and as a result, um, some things happened that were, that were good for everyone. And he set himself apart. Number three. People of greatness cry out for a miracle to be a miracle for someone else. In other words, they're not just self-seeking. You can see aspects of this and go, well, it sounds like he's kind of asking for things, asking for his area to be enlarged and those kind of things. It says, but, but, um, but there's something very specific that he prayed. And, and, and he, he prayed for God's hand to be involved. I want your hand to be with me. 
um, he prayed for he prayed for God's presence for him to be with him he says uh, that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain I mean who who's who you know if you think about it is that where we pray oftentimes we're going God can you do this and this and this and this and then by the way when you're done with that tomorrow I need you to do this and this and this and here's yes he did have a specific request but he says keep me from evil I don't want you to do this at any cost. I don't want these things to happen to me at any cost. Please keep me from evil and help me not to cause pain. He was aware of pain. He knew his pain. Have you ever prayed that God would help you not to cause pain? That might be a wonderful prayer to insert into our prayer this week. Lord, help me not to be a pain in the behookas of someone else this week, you know? However you want to, but, but just, just help me not to be a pain in the neck. Help me not to be a person who is a pain. I think that'd be a pretty good prayer to pray. I no longer want to walk in those habits, these addictions, that mindset, causing people pain anymore. I want to be a blessing to people. I want to be a miracle to someone. And I want to encourage you. God wants you to do that. He wants you to be that. Ask him for it. Number four, people of greatness maintain faith even when others don't. Seems as though there weren't maybe a lot of people praying out to God at this point. And so he did. And as a result, the scripture says God granted him his request and uh, understand this, God always answers our prayer. He doesn't always answer the way we prayed it or in the way that we prayed it, but he always answers prayer. And, so, and I also need to say this. Do you know that no is an answer? I think, I, I think that maybe kids today, I'm not, maybe mine, yours probably aren't this way, but my kids, I think they think that no means I need to ask about 15 more times. I said, oh, he said no, but then I just need to ask again. And, you know, in, as parents, we're guilty. That's the re reason that happens is because our first no doesn't always mean no. Because I don't know. I mean, I'm an older parent at this point. I know I look very young and everything. But anyway, I'm a little older parent than some. And so I'm an older parent. And so as a result, there are some days when I feel a little worn down. Now, this is my excuse, okay? But I feel a little bit worn out. So there's been a few times, I'm just going to admit, after about the fourth or fifth time, like, well, what are you asking for? Like, yeah, get it. And I'm thinking, if, if you don't ask me again, go ahead and get it. Now, I don't want to make that a habit, but I have done that out of this year. That's, that's what I call lazy parenting, okay? That's lazy parenting. That's not good parenting. It's lazy parenting. Because what our kids need to know is no is an answer. What we need to know with God is that no is an answer. Do you know God has a right to tell you no? Oh, but isn't he loving? Isn't, isn't God loving? This whole thing about God being loving, God is loving. But just because he, I mean, you love your kid, you're going to let him play in the street? I mean, this whole idea of love and God being loving means there can't be any no, there can't be anything, there can't be any absolutes, is a bunch of baloney. Someone loves you, there's going to be times they tell you no because they love you. Because there's some things that we, so I'm just simply saying, God always answers prayer. In this place, he did answer prayer. And it sounds like he answered prayer because it says that he granted him his request. So he answered prayer according to the way he, that, that, uh, that it was being prayed. And I think it's because of the condition of Jabez's heart. His heart was asking in the right place. But I just need to, I just need to clear that up as we go through. No is an answer as well, okay? Number five, people of greatness honor the past while engaging the future. Now, I want you to look at the last part of 1 Chronicles 4. These mentioned by names were leaders. These people in this chapter were leaders, and their families or their father's house increased greatly. So these were the great people. And Jabez, who we don't know who his dad was, we kind of left scratching our hands going, who, where did this guy come from? Where, where did he drop in here from? He got included with all of these leaders. Why? Well, it, it, it seems as though that he chose to engage with God. And in doing so, 
changed the course of his history and everybody who came behind. And so people of greatness honor the past while engaging the future. I, I heard a tribute uh, that was given uh, of, a, of, a, of, of a pastor to his father. And it's, it sounded to me like his father. I did not know these people personally. But it sounded like this father was an awesome guy. He was a, um, he, he was he was a person of character, a person who had six children, and uh, had been a diligent father, not a perfect man, but a diligent father. And this son did his service, and in doing his service, here's what he said about this man. And I'm just going to read it to you because I don't think I can say it without reading it to you. A time will come. This is the. This is the, the son speaking in his father's place to the family. And so he's speaking as though he is the father. He's saying, this is what dad would say. A time will come, my family, when my life will cease and that day has arrived. But when that time comes, I ask that you remember these things. Bury my eyes if you must. But family, don't bury my vision. Bury my body if you must, but don't bury my beliefs. Bury my heart if you must, but don't bury my love for you. Bury my feet if you must, but don't bury the path of my life. To my sons, bury my hands if you must, but don't bury my diligent efforts. To my wife and my daughters, bury my shoulders if you must, but don't bury my concern and love for the family. To all my friends, bury my voice if you must, but don't bury the message of my life. To my grandkids, bury my mind if you must, but children, don't bury my dreams. To those that have come to honor me, bury me if you must but don't bury my life. To those that I've grown to be with as family and friends, I submit to you. If you must bury something, bury my faults, bury my weaknesses. If you must bury something, bury the times I've let you down, bury the arguments we had in anger, bury the words I spoke that discouraged you. And most of all, if you must bury something, bury every pain and sadness that would stop my life from continuing in you. This is what it sounds like. Someone who honors the past and values the future. It seemed to me that Jabez had come from a place of pain. And he said, God, I'm asking you to bless me. And I want you to bless me so that I can be a blessing. So that when this life is finished and my peace here is done, that there will, from the planting of my life, from the fruit of my life, there will be a greater measure of effectiveness that goes on way past the burying of my body. And I just want to say to you this morning, greatness, as we all know, is not summed up in what we have. It's summed up in who we are. And most importantly, even who we are in Christ. And how that get lives, gets lived out and reflected in our lives to others. And I don't think any of us get it perfect. Any of us get it where we're going like, man, I just, I just did it all right. We don't. But I go back to what Tom said earlier. Let's never quit endeavoring to do what is right. 